Hey guys, Infidel1258 here. Hope you're doing well. Today I actually want to get into a topic about how NFT blockchain based video games are going to become attractive, entice new audiences and grow radically. And I think it comes down to one massive point that we can draw distinction across Splinterland, Splinter Forge, Immortal Creed and other blockchain based video games that we already know about. It's one distinction that they can get right or get wrong and that failure or success will transform their adoption. I'm convinced of this. I hope you'll listen because I actually think if we as a community can come to agreement around what will change the game and massively cause adoption, then I think we bring that with our voice, with our dollar, with our Discord community conversations to the developers, we can change and redirect where these things will go. So let's talk about how we can radically invite and create massive incentive for huge new player growth in each of our favorite blockchain based video games. We're going to start with Splinter Lands and I want to show you what I think they get right. And I absolutely need to then c compare it to some of the other games that we play uh, and that I play in Murrah Creed, uh, Gollum Overlord and Splinter Forge. We're going to look at each of them. But the point I want to start with is that the path the, the, the crux of the issue is going to focus around the idea of do you have genuine choice? Is there actual a depth of experience within the options and circumstances that the player will f will encounter? And therefore, is there a satisfying sense of accomplishment or victory when there is a battle, a success, a victory or a loss. Like, is there satisfaction in that process? It absolutely is going to depend on the genuine nature or the superficial nature of choice within the context of battle. So what do I mean? Within Splinterlands, let's play a battle in Modern Renown. We find ourselves an opponent. We see that there's a rule of combat here. This is the gladiator rule, uh, meaning I can choose a gladiator if I want. Are you not entertained? 54 mana cap. These are the splinters that are available. Immediately, I know that I'm I'm funneled down a specific path of options. I can't pick fire. I can't pick dragon. I can't go more than 54 mana. I don't have to take, take this into consideration, but, it, but failing to do so will affect or impact or may affect and impact my likelihood of success. I can look at my, my opponent's past five teams. That isn't necessarily going to cornhole or... Um, uh, pigeonhole them into a specific rule but as you can see they do play a lot of water so that's interesting they have access to water they don't have access to dragon so i think we can we can envision a a, a melee foe all of these are almost almost all of them are melee focused he used uh grim barton smith more than once so let's kind of imagine a blue team with a grim barton smith or with a melee focus i would to avoid grim barton smith I do, I, I'm going to anticipate Grim Barton Smith, and I'm going to try and avoid, meaning Scattershot will be perf will be desirable. Now, I don't have access to my my Jassic. What are my Scattershot options? Let me, let me play around. I want you to see, as I'm picking this, notice how I'm imagining what my opponent has and what they don't have. And I'm, I'm really, even now, trying to counter what I'm expecting, right? I'm trying to counter what I'm expecting. And that is important because it speaks to the genuine options in front of me. Like I have options to, I'm running out of time here, so I need to focus up for a bit, for a beat here. Who's my best main tank? This is interesting because it's lots of hit points. He could, be, I don't think he's gonna bring in Mortalis. But I don't think I need to worry about Shatter exactly. I don't exactly like the Legionnaire, except if it's got tons and tons of like sustain and whatnot. And let's see if we can bring our Dally Guardian. Kulu might not be the play, but I'm out of time. Ren Relinor might not be the play. Ah, I might regret this. Oh yeah, let's do that. I like that better. Okay. So, uh, and I'll place my ar archery. Oh, he's got the ops. Dang, he's got op. 
He's got op. So they're gonna focus fire my back, my gem meteor, which is annoying. Oh, no, they're gonna focus fire my Dalent Guardian first and foremost. And we do have a protect and he doesn't have a, a rust. So I was right about this and I was right about the melee. I was right about blue. Um, so as I picked that team, you heard me thinking through what my opponent's gonna do, what how I can counter that, what are my options with which splinters I should look at. I only had two minutes, so I had to rapidly think about this. You guys who know Splinter Lights understand the complexity of what transpired just now. The multitude of options, even with only four available splinters, there was a multitude of options available, right? I'll let the play, video play in the back while I continue to talk about this. I really wanna build the case of what Splinter Lines is doing well here. The multitude of options, I could go melee, archery, magic. I can use non-attacking monsters and and um, create weapons trainer opportunities with that. Um, I can, I can f be very offensive and, and not care about repairs, restorations, um, heals, triages, or I can be very defensive as kind of a Grim Barton Smith play. And, and what do I do in that context? Well, I'm, I'm going to try and go more sustainability, more sort of survivability. He's got, he's got some crazy martyrs happening over here with the Isgold, which is a, which is pretty powerful, but I'm still feeling okay about this right now. We'll see. I don't know if I'm good, but that, see, I love that the Isgold hit over here. Um, I think I'm probably in trouble unless we just go ahead and rip. No, see, we're, we're attacking in three different spots. We're, this guy's coming over here. This guy's coming over here. This guy's coming around. We're done. Regardless, the multitude of options and variability within play style give me a, a huge sense of agency. Do you agree? People who don't get Splinter Lines and say the game is boring, they don't understand that. They think... Maybe because you have a limited deck, maybe because you're stuck in bronze, maybe because you just you don't really understand the depth of experience and the nuance between different synergies across abilities within, you know, one splinter versus another, how that can feel. All of those differences create an absolute sense of agency for the player who has to think through the best approach versus the worst approach. That play that I just did might have worked. It, 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 with one or two minor changes maybe the summoner was wrong maybe i shouldn't have picked maybe i should have brought another protect maybe i should have used a different gladiator maybe i should have you know there's just one or two little things that can radically transform a, a loss into a victory and that matters and yes there absolutely is metas within this game and there are certain if i go into the leaderboard and look at the let's go to let's go in a champ leaderboard and let's look at the la actually not leaderboard top battles these are champion top battles. Look at this. This is Yasik versus TH13. They both pick Lily Shieldpaw. 43-37, 43-89. These are top of the top. They both pick Lily. They both pick Grim Barton Smith. They both pick Skok Dustblight. They both pick... This is this is almost exactly... Uh, the exact... Almost the exact same team, except for we see a Nalara Gynek over here uh, with Yasik. And we see instead a, doc, a Dr. Blight with a Magi Necrosi. So, but very similar teams. Is this wild? This is modern too. So that's not even a bot. That's just them playing logically what they feel they perceive to be the best play. There are niches that are, it's so obvious what you have to play. There are metas where you have to play X, Y, or Z. But generally speaking, a game like Splinterlands does something beautifully. They give the player a sense of agency. What you choose matters. How you respond to the rule sets, the mana caps, the available splinters matter. Your interpretation of the synergies that are available matter. Eventually, we know that we're going to get items and spells, which are going to further compound that sense of personal choice. Whether you choose choose to win or lose is or essentially going to be, in some sense, up to you. Because items and spells, in the same way that tactic summoners allow you to give even more control to what's going to unfold in the battle it's going to grow and grow and grow with items and spells so the 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 win condition within splinter lands depends on the player input yes it depends on your card ownership yes it depends on your assets within the game you can't get away with not owning but do you see how player agency is relevant and how that's been the secret sauce in this game if you get splinter lands i think you get that already but as we look at other games and you know immortal creed we're gonna see that that's not the case 
And look, I like Immortal Creed and I'm playing it daily. And I actually spent a couple hundred bucks on the on the packs. And I and I would encourage people if they like NFT blockchain based gaming to to support something like this. Because it's at the infant stage and it actually is pretty good so far. But is it perfect? And and how does it fall short within the context of that player agency? I want to show you. And I'm going to show you the same within Golem Overlord and Splinter Forge because other games that I'm playing on the high blockchain, and maybe there are ones that I, that do this well, the ones I'm playing aren't at the level that Splinterlands is with respect to player choice, agency, and therefore that sense of satisfaction when victory does come. Look at this. This is um, you, in Immortal Creed, you select an immortal, that's your hero. He's gonna represent, he's gonna go to battle. You're gonna equip him with items and spells after you after you, after you you pick your, your immortal. This is the one uh, rule set that we see. No melee weapons are allowed. Okay, so I'm not gonna pick plus melee. And it's quite clear, not recommended. And these ones are not recommended because they're not leveled up. I want to point out quickly that my level, my lower level ones only have 200 hit points. My higher level ones have 300. That's a huge difference. And that's one point I want to draw. Uh, I want to point you to. Um, I also want to say that it did tell me who my opponent picked last time, which is cool. It, again, that is a thoughtfulness and that's going to that's gonna add to that sense of player agency because it gives me this ability to respond to what my opponent just recently did. Now, it's a little less complicated than Splinterlands because they give you five battles. This one gives you one, but still that's something. So there's there are little glimmers or silver linings here. But the big point I want to make is that like the, the there's lack of agency because there really is a right and a wrong choice in a game like this. You d with no melee weapons, I could have picked a uh, summoner that had melee damage in buff. Of course, it doesn't make any sense. But other than that, there's four or five other options. But mm, but if you don't have them leveled up, it's not like they're even close. Like a level two is going to have 200 hit points. A level three is going to have 300 hit points. That makes all the difference. There's simply no way to win with a with a level two versus a level three. I have to pick my team quickly. I I picked uh, archery buff, so I'm going to go ahead and just pick my and let's look at this quickly. Which which archery? I have seven seconds, but which archers uh, am I going to pick? Well, the highest ones, and they're organized from highest to lowest. I got to pick this one. 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 There's no other option. The other options were objectively worse. So, do I have choice? Do I have agency when the other the options that exist outside of my immortal that I chose and outside of the items that I chose, they literally are objectively worse. No, I don't really have choice. I can either buy more packs and get more items that then level up and maybe those other items will then become more powerful because they get that from go from level two to level three. That's not satisfying to a player in the sense in the sense that Splinterlands offers where I actually <clears throat> have a multitude of flexibility and I can win with lower level cards. And, and that's one of the things I want to point to. It, it actually is broken or damaged. The system is damaged or broken when there is stark contrast between levels. If you look at, I'm going to win this one, I think. Uh, we, we I can let it play out. Yeah, I'm going to probably win. But um, th if there's too great of a contrast between one level and the next, what ends up happening is you cannot play the lower level card. And I, I think in Splinterlands this could happen too, but it just doesn't happen because of how they planned it. If I go to Peak Monsters quickly and I just grab any random card, let's just look at Nalara, Nalara Gynek. Legendary, Magic Caster, nine mana, one BCX, level one, has uh, one damage, three speed, three armor, nine hit points, and amplify. Level two has only extra ability is an extra, or sorry, only extra stat is an extra armor. And then it introduces silence. Now that's a big buff. The silence is, an, is a very consequential increase to its, its, its card value. Level three, same stats, one extra armor, and now void. That is huge. That is very significant. But is, are the stats going wild? Like, is this one 100 hit points and this one's 200 hit points and this one's 300 hit points? No. And that matters, man. You have to keep it within these ranges of proximity where it's not a deal breaker. It doesn't simul it doesn't instantly cause me to lose if I if I want to play a level one Nalara in a silver match or maybe even a gold match. Now that would be low level. That's a bronze card, and I'm talking about maybe playing it in in, in gold. I don't think that's gonna 
predispose you to victory. It's not going to give you your best advantage because that is a significant jump or, or lack of, uh, of level. But it doesn't necessarily cost you the game. And there are times absolutely where that makes sense. When we look at gladiators, we, uh, we can see that too. Gladiators are scarce enough that you can get away with playing lower level cards in, um, in higher level matches because, um, you know, just because of because of the scarcity, you can you can it, it absolute level four common can play in diamond level matches, maybe more so in the guild brawls, but sometimes because of the rule set within rank balls. So how what's the point within something like this? We see we see there isn't really choice. I have to pick the highest level immortal that I have access to now. I might have five high level, I might have five properly leveled immortals and I do then have choice amongst them, but with one rule set, the impact of my choice is limited. And because of how distinct the, the levels are across cards on items as well, it ends up really making its own choice. Now look at this, random poison is this round. So I'm, I, I have to pick the Kusetu. He is 60% reduced poison damage, plus he has 315 hit points. And that's just a, his, he's a level three, but he has extra hit points because of, I guess the developers felt his ability was not as impactful as like a, a, a damage buff. And so I'm gonna definitely pick him. And I pick him every time that rule set comes up. Now, if, if he was a level two, I wouldn't, but he's appropriately leveled so I can go ahead and select him. Now, again, last time I picked archery because I had a, I had a plus archery damage uh, immortal, immortal, but I'm going to pick archery again because my archery cards are actually amongst my better cards. If I show you my, my, my melee cards, I have some pretty decent ones, level three, level three, level three. Um, but they are by no, like, look at this 25 hit point, 25 damage, 24, 23, 20, 44 for a two slot. When I come back to archery, 21 to 27, that that's significantly higher plus poison damage 21 to 27 21 to 26 40 to 48 each one of these is more damaging than those melee cards i just showed you plus these each fire at three seconds as opposed to five seven eight seconds if you don't fully understand just understand these are i'm saying to you i'm giving you objective evidence on these stats that show you these are objectively better within the context of immortal creed why does that matter again I have choices within this game. I could pick the melee, but but at some point you ask, why would you ever? And I don't know if I'm going to win this battle, but I know for a fact I put the best team on the table within the context available. Period. It's not a subjective conversation. There isn't nuance to that. You know, it's just there was a right and there's a wrong. Is that the case within Splinterlands? I would argue no, definitively not. Now. Again, there are metas in Splinterlands, but but the but Immortal Creed is suffering from a lack of player agency, and there will be a lack of player adoption because there is less entertainment when I truly have no options. When literally, you know, the scenario is A, and I have to give solution A, that is the only real viable option. That no longer feels like a game. It feels like an, an input. It feels like a captcha where I have to just go ahead and say, well, click on click on uh, the stoplight. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just this automated, well, I have, there's a right decision and there's a wrong. I'm gonna pick the right decision to the best of my ability within my the, the power and effectiveness of my deck. And the same, did I win this one? Yeah, I won this one. And the same is true over here with Golem Overlord, which will move quicker through. Um, and Splinter Forge. Splinter Forge, um, side note, Splinter Forge has this, this uh, airdrop or this like daily reward. So make sure you're, you are logging in. They're giving away things. You one, Every 24 hours, you can get a little something. Uh, but we'll move quicker through these last two. But I want to say that it's the same. It really is the same thing. And if we don't, if we like these games, if you like Immortal Creed, if you like Splinter Forge, if you like Golem Overlord, if you like the idea that blockchain based video gaming could represent a revolution and could you know offer significant financial reward to the people who play i think you need to be communicating with these communities on discord or you know wherever they they are whether it's twitter or or wherever 
because we absolutely can have a voice in this moment. You look at teams like Splinterlands looking for our FAQs, offering town hall contact, answering our questions. The same is true with these other communities. You just need to get involved and let your voice be heard. Because if I show you here too, well, yeah, look, there's four sort of abilities on this monster and he has this that sort of damage. There's a complexity to me understanding how best to approach this, absolutely. So you might say, look at all these options. This There's tons of agency, there's tons of player decision. Yes and no. My selections really do fall into a few different scenarios. I'm not even gonna, I'm just gonna back out and I'm gonna show you some of the, I go to the other, I go to the leaderboard. Look at the leaderboard on Blagor. Leaderboard. So if I look, uh, not leaderboard, my apologies, recent battles. Recent battles, I can't show you their full team, but I can show you the best teams. Look at it on the screen here. Uh, this one has 1800 points. This one has 2200 points. I bet they'd use the same summoners. Let's watch. Show team. Yasik uh, and Lily Shieldpaw. I bet that's the exact same choice down here. Yasik, Lily Shieldpaw. Let's look at this higher one. 930. I bet it's Yasik and Shieldpaw. All of the best teams. And, and if I had done my battle, I would have picked Yasik and Shieldpaw. I'm telling you guys, this I played this game enough times that I'm that I can accurately report at least within the Gold League some monster, which is the Black Org currently. It's absolutely the case that there's a right and there's a wrong. Now you might not have those cards, but if you do have them, there is a right choice. It's to play them, and there's a wrong choice not to play them. Now there are certain times where the 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 random rules will change, and maybe that alters something. But generally speaking, it doesn't. And so again, there's a there there can be a false nature of of options, of like a superficial. There can be a superficiality to player agency, and you need to avoid that. You absolutely need to give meaningful choice to the player, in order to give people a sense of enjoyment when they choose the right thing and when, because that's where joy comes from. Recognize giving me an opportunity to lose, and yet a path to, to win through talent, through card acquisition, through, you know, observation skills on, on what my opponent plays. If I can navigate that path and carve out a greater than 50% win rate, that is absolutely the sort of game that's going to satisfy its player and it's going to grow in its player base. Same with Golem Overlord, it lacks this. Like when I come in here, what I'm doing is ultimately I'm, I'm, I'm managing my economy and that's a game and I enjoy that, but it is superficial. I want these numbers to go up. I want more power. I want more fortification. I want more car charging station. I want more faith. I want more bank. I want more prestige level. It's not like there are advantages to having lower or, or higher. It's not like there are certain break points that would make a lot of sense. You know, if, if 225 was better than 224 in a significant way, that would make, you know, there would make us another level of handling by the player. And then when we come into battles, which is a pathway in this game to steal part from other op opponents in the game, you know, I can, I can do things like I can find opponents that are within ranges that are optimized for me to win against which is something like this for me at my current level i look at 215 fortification 175 faith i organize them by stash there's other ways to approach this but these are going to be some of the better opponents that i have access to that i i will likely win 80 to 100 percent of the time so i could steal from him right now but i mean is that like deeply thoughtful from my perspective not really I find all I did was I entered an input here that produces, generally speaking, opponents that give me a long, a, a significant win probability, 80 to 100 percent. And then I click on the ones that have the highest number of stash and I just attack those ones because they're going to give me the greatest reward with the maximum opportunity for victory. There is a thoughtfulness to it. It's not void of thoughtfulness and agency. But do you see the trend, the radical difference between Immortal Creed, Golem Overlord, Splinter Forge, and something like Splinter Lands that gives you the opportunity to navigate rule sets, mana caps, different decks, different leagues, modern or wild. Guild Brawls look in one way, tournaments look another. Each one of them have significant rewards and opportunities. Soulbound reward cards have no financial revenue sort of value, but at the same time, they're, they, they're desirable and powerful and interesting. And so there's these different pathways or interests within a game like Splinterlands where they've gone ahead and they've, they've created a reason for you to want to play, a pathway for you to, to pursue or or produce victory, but yet it's never guaranteed, even when you have the best of the best cards because of a certain amount of 
randomness within, for instance, poison drops or blo um, stuns or, you know, other RNG that's just possible within this game. And so Splinterlands does something beautiful and right that not everybody gives it credit for. It's it's a true and genuine sense of player agency. And they they navigate the card development in a way that doesn't that steps up power but doesn't do these massive leaps between level. And so games like these other ones I mentioned and ones that maybe you love on the high blockchain or elsewhere need to learn something from this if they want to step in in a big way to that sort of player adoption and driving, you know, joy and entertainment because a game will be powerful if it is rewarding. It will be adopted if it gives financial reward, but it will be loved and it will grow and sustain itself across years if it's not only rewarding, but it's also fun. And that's the beauty of Splinterlands. If you agree, drop a like. Let me know in the comments below what you think about these four games, about any others. I'd love to hear. And I just want to leave it there, guys. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Have an amazing day. God bless.